perspective, uh, gastroenterologist in uh, Asamil's Kanur. Warm welcome to you, sir. Next, we have uh, my own colleague, uh, Dr. Kavida. She has been working in uh, AKG Hospital and Dhanlashmi Hospital, and recently in uh, Astamins Kannur. A warm welcome to you, madam. Next is um, Dr. Javed, who is a gastroenterology surgeon, isn't it? No, gastroenterologist. Uh, I think he, he, he's ca coming here to, uh, to our physicians club for the first time. Uh, warm welcome to you, Dr. Javed. The fourth person is the Dr. Vivek, a senior specialist, uh, and uh, warm welcome to you. Next is Dr. Vijesh. Warm welcome to you, Vijesh. The last person in the department is the Dr. Jazim. is uh, not a new person here. He is uh, from Kanur itself. He is a son of uh, my close friend, Dr. Ansari. Uh, warm welcome to you, Jas. Today's topic discussion, uh, I think it will highlight the important aspects, uh, clinical aspects in gastroenterology. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Sabu will uh, guide us or uh, present the different topics and who is going to uh, present the different topics, Dr. Sabu will uh, say. Over to Dr. Sabu. We are uh, starting a humble uh, novel initiative called Malabar GA Clinics. Uh, what we are planning is uh, to have bi-monthly clinics. That means uh, once in two months, we'll be having this sort of uh, case presentation, both online and offline. Either YouTube or uh, Zoom link we'll be providing. So anybody can access from, any, from your home also, you can have access. And this is the first edition, actually. We are uh, starting with this uh, uh, student club. In this edition, we are having four case presentations. One is a unique case of acute on chronic liver failure being presented by Dr. Bijosh Kumar. Second one is interesting case of uh, chronic abdominal pain presented by Dr. Vivek. And third one is a drug-induced liver injury by a herbal drug. It is called Healy by Dr. Javed. And fourth one is Non-endoscopic management of massive upper GI bleed by Dr. Jasim. And our second edition will be in uh, August 22nd. That is uh, two months uh, from here. And this will be presented in uh, Kannur Surgeons Club. Because this is actually, as you know, gastroenterology as a specialty is a link between medicine and surgery. Actually, we are having uh, best of both, uh, both ways, both surgery and medicine because of uh, our access to endoscopy. Actually, uh, we are uh, now replacing many of uh, surgical procedures 
using endoscopy. So our second edition is uh, highlighting that one. So we are presenting four case uh, endoscopic uh, procedures like achalasia cardia managed by peroral endoscopic myotomy and replacing Heller's myotomy, laparoscopic Heller's myotomy, giving sim similar or more than uh, uh, result uh, compared to laparoscopic Heller's myotomy. And the second one is a neuroendocrine tumor of rectum, grade two neuroendocrine tumor managed by endoscopic full thickness resection. That means uh, we are resecting even muscle also with this uh, newer device, EFTR device. Third one is a patient with acute cholestates with uh, comorbid condition, cardiac and uh, renal disease, managed entirely by US guided cholestogastrostomy. That means we are putting a stent into the gallbladder, going into the gallbladder and removing the stone. And uh, the fourth one is a patient with acute necrotizing pancreatitis managed by US guided necrosectomy. That means we are entirely replacing laparoscopy with endoscopic procedures. We can uh, even remove entire necrosome or uh, this necrotic material from pancreas through endoscope. And uh, the outcome is even better than surgical procedures. So everything is possible with uh, because of this team. So we are starting our uh, first uh, clinic and I'm inviting Dr. Josh Kumar to start our proceedings. Thank you. Uh, good evening. So the first case is a unique case of acute and chronic liver failure. So here we have a 52 year old male, uh, a non case of chronic liver disease, ethanol related and type 2 DM. There is no history of recent binge, no history of any previous history of jaundice, ascites, encephalopathy, or GI bleed. He presented with fever of one month duration. He was initially managed elsewhere and was referred to a hospital where he was already treated with IV antibiotics, piperacin, dacibactam, and discharged to home. Now presented to our hospital with a recurrence of fever, altered sensorium, difficulty in walking, and worsening jaundice. On arrival, the patient was drowsy, GCS score of 14 to 15, and f there were flaps, ascites was present, knee joint swelling with local rise of temperature and tenderness, and blood pressure was 150 by 90, and pulse rate was 118 with temperature of 191 degree Fahrenheit. So course in the hospital, on day one, with a low GCS and grade two hepatic encephalopathy with fever, he was admitted in ICU. He was started on anti-HE measures, started on IV meropenem and vancomycin. Pan cultures were sent. His knee effusion was drained off pus and cultures were sent. It was suggestive of septic arthritis, clinically. On day four, he developed respiratory distress. It's wor worsening of uh, um, uh, clinical symptom. And initially, he was managed with HFNC and Later, he developed type 1 respiratory failure with ARDS, and patient was intubated and mechanically ventilated. At this moment, we decided to take CT brain, and it showed uh, mild cerebral atrophy with no other significant changes. CCT abdomen was done, and it showed features of chronic liver disease, along with small hypoatenating lesions in the segment 6 and 3. Similar hypoatenating, hypoenhancing areas were also noted in the splenic parenchyma, also in the left kidney, prostate, and along with that there was ascites. So there was multiple organs were involved in his in this uh, CT. Here you can see the prostate, which is showing a hypoenhancing uh, parenchymal lesion, along with the there is a lesion in the liver as well as in the spleen. Here. Here you can see in the liver, then in the, in the spleen and also there is one hyper-enhancing lesion. Here you can in the prostate also there is a hyper-enhancing lesion. So what do you think the possible etiologies at this moment? Patient with a chronic liver disease, with no history of any binge, now present with one month duration of fever with multiple sister involvement. 
possible small abscess like lesions in liver, spleen, prostate, and even uh, kidney. Patient not responding to piperazine and tazobactam. Yeah, that is <laughs> straightforward diagnosis. So it is a case of mediodosis I'm discussing. But the, the confusing part in this patient was initially blood culture revealed it was E. coli. So he received piperazine and tazobactam. But fever persisted in spite of that. So here there was a diagnostic dilemma but everything was pointing to yes yes we did uh, echo was done by a screening echo was done but yes so these are the investigations on day one and day four see um, so here you can see his um, total bilirubin his total bilirubin was initially 5.8. Along with that, his albumin was 1.8, and INR was 2.21. So I am stressing on these areas because he's a chronic liver disease. So there is another concept which I am putting forward here that is known as acute and chronic liver failure. Usually we know about the acute decompensation of the cirrhosis, where the compensated cirrhosis decompensates with ascites, bleeding, or jaundice, or hepatic encephalopathy. But usually this patient doesn't require a hospital admission or maybe managed in the ward. But acute and chronic liver failure, they have a high 28-day mortality. So they require an ICU care and critical management. So here the bilirubin is 5 and INR is 2.2. So that is a noting point here. Similarly, on admission, the patient's child status was child C, that is A. By day four, when the respiratory distress developed, it is 13, so it has worsened to child C. S similarly, there is worsening of the male score, and if you see the number of organ dysfunction, that apart from the liver and perhaps an encephalopathy, which can we can put in the brain in that area, apart from these two, on day four, there is a respiratory distress. Patient required ventilation. That means an organ involvement is there. And we did pan cultures in this patient. So the so first blood culture was E. coli, which is done outside. Then subsequently, we did a second blood culture in hospital. It came in Bacolier Sudamele. Similarly, patient had a knee joint pus, which was culture, which also showing Bacolier Sudamele, along with the prostatic abscess. There was no other evidence elsewhere. On day six, patient was extubated, clinical improvement of the liver function and recovery of encapillopathy. After day 20, that is almost 20 days later, patient had hematuria. He underwent repeat CT abdomen. Again, it showed a large prostatic abscess, which was a, with possible evidence of pseudoaneurysm. So how the patient was managed? Patient was managed with IV meropenem for the first two weeks. That is an intensive phase. Then it was followed by oral cotrimazol. Once the cultures were available, we added cotrimazol along with the meropenem. After two weeks, we shifted to oral cotrimazol. At, th at the moment, patient is still almost six months, still on cotrimazole, patient doing well. And the most, uh, uh, most important thing is that now the child is, uh, patient's child status is almost A. So mm -hmm. we, we have been following up these cases, all uh, acute and chronic liver failure we are following because we are a part of the ARC consortium. So we do have a follow-up data and if you see, the bilirubin on admission was 5.8 and INA was 1.2 with a grade 2 hepatic encephalopathy. Patient easily qualifies into acute and chronic liver failure according to the APASAL Asia Pacific Islands. And if you follow up, by day 6, patient became better. On day 4, there was worsening of symptoms where bilirubin became 7. And by day 15, or post extubation, See, the bilirubin is 3.65, INR is 1.26, and albumin is 2.6. And elevated albumin also indicates a good liver function. And if you see, on, if you follow up beyond 30 and beyond 90 days, all the parameters have improved. See, the bilirubin is on day 180, it is 0 
and alumin is 3.8 and INR is 1.2. So these are the uh, clinical parameters at the time of admission and uh, post follow. -up. It has also shown significant decrease. So patient was managed with meropenem and vancomycin initially, which was later shifted to meropenem and cortimosol and subsequently on cortimosol. So here you can see the child's status on day zero of admission was six. By day four with one organ involvement, it became 13. And by day 90, that is now almost nine. Similarly with the male score. So here one important score that I am showing is the ARC score. Th this is what we are evaluating as a group. The ARC score is one which decides how much is severity is the acute on chronic liver failure. That decides whether the patient has to be transplant listed, whether the patient can be managed conservatively, or how, what is the mortality in first 28 days when you have an acute on chronic liver failure. So in this patient, summary is uh, chronic liver disease, alcohol related, acute on chronic liver failure with R score of 10, Precipitated by severe systemic meliodosis, complicated with hepatic encephalopathy, coagulopathy, multiple intra-abdominal septic foci, septic arthritis, ARDS, and currently on cotrimazole. So uh, discussion points will be what is the concept of ACLF, the definition of ACLF, and window period, and reversibility of liver function. So the concept uh, of acute on chronic liver failure. Basically, this is a, an abrupt and life-threatening worsening of clinical condition in a patient with cirrhosis or chronic liver disease. So why it is such a debatable um, issue is because there are a lot of different definitions and criteria based on the region, whether it's a North American, whether it's an American, European, as well as Chinese and Asia. So we here follow the apostle criteria. So the main controversies are usually related to the the type of acute insult. What are the insult, the insult that is happening to the compensated liver? What is the insult? How will you define these insults? There are two types. Either it is an intrahepatic insult or extrahepatic, where the infection that is happening elsewhere can also precipitate the liver failure. Or any insult directly happening to the liver, like a reactivation of hepatitis B or autoimmune hepatitis which is getting activated. All these are direct liver injury which can worsen the liver function. So type of insult is what differentiates these criteria. The second is the stage of underlying liver disease, whether it, there is underlying cirrhosis or underlying chronic liver disease like chronic hepatitis. And presence of concomitant extrahepatic organ failure. So I will come to that. So here you can see, uh, see the normal liver, there is acute insult and it, uh, it results in acute liver failure. So the insult happening in a normal liver will fail ALF, okay. So when there is a chronic liver disease, an acute insult can lead to liver failure, which represents the acute and chronic liver failure. Okay, so how the definition happens is there should be worsening of the jaundice jaundice will be more than 5 with a coagulopathy with INR more than 1.5 plus or minus hepatic encephalopathy. So in compensated cirrhosis an acute insult occurs it can either go into a direct decompensation I already told you a mild form of decompensation where there is ascites injuriously happening with no severe risk or it can end up in an acute and chronic liver failure. In decompensated cirrhosis, if an acute insult occurs, there is further worsening of the decompensation. That is the new criteria as per the apostle. If you consider the European guidelines, they will include the decompensated cirrhosis into the acute and chronic liver failure. So in apostle, in our guidelines, in Asia guidelines, we don't include previously decompensated liver into acute and chronic liver failure. So any patient with ascites or past history of ascites bleeding, hepatic encephalopathy, now presenting with acute worsening of liver function, usually will not come and fall in the acute and chronic liver failure criteria. It should be a fresh decompensation. 
So I have already defined the parcel definition. These are the main thing where you have a bilirubin which is more than five, INA more than 1.5, and within four weeks there should be development of clinical ascites or encephalopathy. Then this can occur in undiagnosed or undiagnosed chronic liver disease or cirrhosis with a high 28 day mortality. So I already discussed difference between Asia, Europe and uh, North American and USA guidelines. The main thing is in APASA guideline, organ involvement is not at all a criteria for diagnosing ACLF. Even before organ involvement or renal failure or respiratory distress, we intervene and we prevent from that from happening. That is the concept. Whereas you go through the U European as well as national guidelines and all, they include organ involvement as a part of uh, this uh, diagnosing ACLF. So the concept is that there is no point in waiting for organ to get involved. You can act before. That is where the concept of window period comes in a parcel. So we use the score ARC score in ACLF grading system where it's a combination of total bilirubin, hepatic encephalopathy grade, INR, lactate and creatine. So a point between five to seven uh, has a 28 day mortality of 12.7, and eight to 10 has a 44 percentage mortality, and 11 to 15 has a 85.9 percentage. So this patient had a 10, so it was 44 percentage mortality in the first 28 days. So the concept of uh, window period is here. See, here you can see there is an acute insult. As per the apostle, even before the organ involvement or extrahepatic organ failure like kidney, lung, brain and circulation and intestinal, even be before development of organ involvement, you can act. You can reverse and you can bring the liver back to the normal. That is the window period. So this concept of window period and intervention is only there in the upper cell, whereas ESL is defined post organ involvement. So this is a treatment algorithm that we usually follow. So if the R score is less than 10, then um, if the, that is up to seven days, that is the first seven days is the most critical period, that is a window period. So you calculate the R score on the day of admission, then you calculate after seven. And seven, if the point of R score decreases by uh, more than two points with no organ failure, then then the, there is a possibility patient will recover with supported treatment. If there is no further decrease of more than two points and no, with the, then you have to do an organ support plus or minus bridge therapy. That means the role of transplant has to be discussed with the patient. So at the day seven, you have to note that the day seven, the ARC score has to fall by more than two points with no organ failure. Similarly, if R score is more than 11, then you have to directly think about liver transplant in this patient. So if this patient had an R score of 10, that's why we were able to manage and the patient was improving. And the window period is where we gave the intensive therapy. We gave meropenem with cortimersol during that window period. That's why the patient reversed. So this is the meliodosis treatment that, that is available. Uh, so there are two phases, that is intensive phase and then the continuation phase. Intensive phase is two weeks of meropenem and continuation phase you give uh, cortimersol. So continuation phase, uh, what do you think, up to how, how long should we give continuation phase in these patients? Patient had a prostatic abscess. How long will you give? Usually, here it is defined around three months, we can uh, stop, but uh, I've seen patients uh, recurring uh, when you stop at three, or three months. So what do you think as physicians, do you think you should give, how, how long you should we give? Six months, okay. okay. By six months we can. 
yeah the uh, yeah that we have drained the prostate because of that uh, prostatic abscess was drained but uh, luckily there was no pseudoaneurysm but it showed pseudoaneurysm in the ct so the here the take home message is uh, acute or chronic liver failure where we should be able to intervene the window period okay and you should be able to calculate the ask score and ask score is less than 10 the patient has a better chance of recovery and if the ask score at the at the end of 7 days if it falls by 2 points then there is a better chance the patient will be off transplant list but if it is more than 2 it is there's doesn't fall by more than 2 points then they very likely put the patient will go into liver transplant list and the ask score of more than 11 the prognosis is very poor mortality rate is very high I already told you around 44 to almost 70 percentage so that's the take home from our side as far as this case is concerned and it's a rare case meliodosis presenting as a case of milio um, acute and chronic liver failure usually we discuss the uh, direct the, uh, hepatic intrahepatic insults but this is a systemic meliodosis which is manifesting as an ACLF thank you Uh, he's a shopkeeper. Um, now he has started good doing work. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, septacidum is, um, but uh, in this case, uh, I, I, I uh, uh, okay, that uh, sensitivity pattern I don't remember, but because the patient was in severe with ACL, ACLF, we decided to go with neuropenia. Pneumonia bar ARDS because there was uh, respiratory distress with uh, type 1 failure. The chest um, X-ray was X-ray was showing X-ray was showing ARDS like picture. No abscess. No abscess. Uh, no. No. <laughs> At this moment, it's very difficult to verify. That's unlikely. There was an acu acute infection, inflammatory. It's an inflammatory marker. Is it?
good evening i guess interesting case of chronic abdominal pain actually uh, it's a 28 year old male patient he's a bank manager without any comorbidities he presented with abdominal pain for last two month duration abdominal pain was uh, diffuse abdominal pain which was mild to moderate in intensity it was not aggravated the fundi fundi leg or no altered bowel habits and it was not associated with the fever jaundice or weight loss or there is no abdominal distension vomiting first it was uh, the abdominal pain was uh, one sort to one or two episode in a week so he, he consulted a local doctor and he had done basic investigation cbc like that cbc and ultrasound he has done cbc it was showing anemia so with 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 the symptomatic management uh, the symptom was improved but for the last uh, uh, two weeks duration it was increased in severity last to one week it was daily the abdominal pain was coming and it was uh, increased it was moderate or it was in severe intensity and he came to our hospital on general examination patient was hemodynamically stable only general examination one pallor was present no jaundice and there was a uh, hypopigmented patches was in the lower limb with uh, suggestive of vitiligo uh, in uh, doing basic investigation uh, in cbc hemoglobin was found to be low it was 9.3 so uh, in, in lft lft showing um, indirect hyperbilirubinemia with a mildly elevated ast and alt level remaining amylase lipase all were normal in view of uh, indirect hyperbilirubinemia we went for to rule out any evidence of hemolysis so you are done reticulocyte count ldh and peripheral smear reticulocyte quartz elevated and uh, ldh was more than 3 times that 780 and peripheral uh, peripheral smear showing uh, mild anisopoiglossidosis many polychromatophytes and nucleated rbc suggestive so of early hemolysis and remaining uh, because of abdominal pain we have done serum calcium and it was no normal and uh, ust abdomen it was showing uh, mild splenomegaly so to rule the uh, causes of uh, hemolysis uh, we have done uh, investigations like direct kumpesh it was a negative because of spino mega mild spino mega was there to rout wilson because wilson wilson can also present with uh, indirect hyperbilirubinemia with uh, hemolysis with uh, elevated uh, enzymes level the serolopresin was a uh, normal and to rule out any hemolysis like, uh, because of uh, spino mega level things are we uh, ruled out uh, because uh, in our uh, kerala it is very rare only that in only vayanad area is, is more is sickling and uh, thalassemia that we have ruled out with uh, signal test was negative and hemoglobin electrophoresis was normal and vitamin b12 also normal because vitamin b12 also can hemolysis with indirect hemoglobin can occur so it was also normal uh, so so evidence of hemolysis was present to rule out any other organic causes we have done uh, ct abdomen with the ct angio it was a uh, normal and we had done one upper endoscope also it was showing and will get it from me uh to rule out the cause of chronic abdominal pain for this one for for you have done euro for for in ala it was came to be negative so one is that uh, uh with the evidence of um, hemolysis and with the chronic abdominal pain one of the remaining all thing were negative we have uh, thought the possibility of any other thing is the lead level lead poisoning is the another important cause so we, we again because we again discussed with the uh, pathologists to the findings as again they have uh, 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 looked at the peripheral smear when it was found to have basophilic stickmy sickling also was there even though basophilic stickmy can uh, can be found in other conditions like thalassemia all things sickling all things basophilic stickmy can present so we have sent the lead serum lead was it was elevated it was uh, 75.75 so next is the what is the cause of the this lead toxicity 
usually we have uh, even doing admission only we ask him about the use of any complementary alternative medication or thing because it's ayurvedic medication actually he was uh, working as uh, working in uh, working as a bank manager in uh, calicut district one peripheral area and he was staying as a paying guest uh, in a single house for the last uh, 3 years so we asked about uh, about the usage of water all thing and uh, about the usage of this complementary alternative medication like ayurvedic medication kasha anything but he denied it uh, denied the usage of anything but uh, last only he told that for vitiligo uh, he was taking unani medication for the last one year duration daily he daily he was taking one tablet per day so mostly we are th uh, so the cause with because now recently we are getting lot of this uh, latoxicity because of this i mainly siddha and unani medication siddha and unani medication are getting so much lead level so we have sent this uh, this one med this medication to the central lab laboratory for analysis report are yet to come so he was taking that uh, unani medication for the last one year duration only but uh, in this case actually three medication we can use dimercarpol and uh, ca calcium disodium edta and third one is penicillin because edta was not available so we started with uh, penicillin oral drug we are given 250 mg eight hourly and uh, we discharged the patient after two weeks uh, we reviewed the patient abdominal pain was uh, abdominal pain was not there and uh, uh, lft also came to normal level and uh, hemoglobin also it was uh, if the nine was it was uh, increased to 11 excellent yes, so lead poisoning mainly is the uh, is occupational and non occupational major we can inhalation ingestion and through uh, skin uh, mainly this one uh, through the those who are in the uh, soil or through the water only but nowadays uh, is the most common cause is the usage of this complementary alternative medication clinical features the uh, person can present with abdominal colic can present with constipation vomiting uh, blue line on gums and uh, basophil stippling anemia patient can present with uh, lead encephalopathy present with seizures delirium, delirium and coma food drop uh, wrist drop can be present thank you good evening the third case for uh, for the day is uh, a case of drug induced liver injury caused by a herbal medication the, uh, the patient was a 48 year old female who presented with history of high colored urine of one week duration and yellowish discoloration of the eyes of two days duration she did not have any history of fever vomiting or abdominal pain no features of cholestasis and no history of any overt bleed over uh, altered sensorium or progressive abdominal distension she did not have any history of uh, similar illness in the past no history of any high risk behavior she had uh, she was a known case of diabetes diagnosed 6 months back and an asthmatic of uh, since long uh, which was well controlled uh, she had a history of uh, intake of uh, complementary ayurvedic medications uh, in the form of uh, chittamrata that is giloy uh, she used to take it and daily she had sourced it from a uh, a person who was known to her and she used to take around 1 cm length of the stem of the plant uh, daily she used to soak it overnight in a glass of water and consume the water the next day along with the stem she used to chew and uh, spit out uh, the rest there was no history of any other high risk behavior uh, she had uh, r rest of uh, the family history there was no history of similar illness in the family there was no history of any other liver disease in the family on examination she was uh, uh, conscious and oriented and physical examination was unremarkable except for ictus there was no stigmata of chronic liver disease uh, systemic examination was within normal limits initial evaluation which was done 
uh, revealed uh, a grossly deranged liver function with a total bilirubin of 7.5 and a direct fraction of 4.5 milligram per deciliter, uh, AST of 864 with an ALT of 997 and an elevated uh, ALP of 380. Uh, serum albumin was normal. Uh, INR was mildly deranged with 1.4 of 1.49. Her renal function was normal. Uh, blood sugars were mildly elevated. She had a normal uh, uh, thyroid uh, stimulating hormone, and her viral markers uh, done by rapid tests were negative. Her urine routine was also normal. Ultrasound showed a normal uh, uh, sized liver with normal echo texture. Portal vein was normal in caliber. Spleen was normal in size. The gallbladder was uh, distended with a 3 mm polyp and the wall thickness was uh, elevated, uh, which was likely uh, reactive. There was no ascites. So we had a 48 year old lady, a diabetic, who presented with painless jaundice of one week duration, associated temporarily with uh, complementary uh, and uh, medica medication intake in the form of giloy without any preceding prodromal illness or cholestatic features not complicated by features of liver failure. She was, uh, we had a provisional diagnosis of acute liver injury of the hepatocellular type. The R ratio was 20, which was highly suggestive of a hepatocellular pattern. The probable etiology we considered included acute viral hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis, or a drug or herbal induced liver injury, and uh, also uh, less likely uh, Wilson's with acute hepatitis as presentation. So uh, she was admitted for further evaluation. On admission, her liver function uh, uh, was similar with a slight decrease in uh, AST and ALT uh, when compared to the previous values. Uh, ANA uh, of was positive, 2 plus at 1 is to 100 dilution, and her serum IgG was mildly elevated, uh, less than 1.1 times the normal limit. But her other uh, markers for viral, uh, sorry, autoimmune panel were negative, ASMA, LKM1, anti SLA uh, were negative, and uh, she ha M AMA M2 was also negative. She had a normal serum ceruloplasmin and a normal transferrin saturation. Uh, viral markers were again repeated using enzyme immunoassay. They were also negative, including a hepatitis A and hepatitis E serology of IgM, which were also negative. Now, uh, because of the liver injury and the temporal association, we planned for a liver biopsy, which was done uh, percutaneously under image guidance. Uh, the procedure was uneventful. Uh, sh she was managed conservatively with hepatoprotectives. Uh, in spite of the deranged liver function, she was clinically stable. She had a, a decent appetite. She was able to take orally. So she was dis uh, her blood sugars were controlled with insulin. She had an uneventful course in the hospital, and she was discharged pending the uh, liver biopsy report. On uh, review with the liver biopsy, uh, as we can see here, uh, at admission, uh, at initial presentation, her uh, AST and ALT were eight, uh, 864 and 997. Uh, she was uh, treated only with withdrawal of the uh, suspected offending drug in the form of Giloy, and uh, she was given only a hepatoprotective. At uh, review one week uh, after uh, the discharge from the hospital, we can see that the ALT has decreased from 997 to 338 within 10 days. That is with only the withdrawal of the drug alone. And uh, her bilirubin had also come down from a peak of 8.3 to 4.3. Uh, um, this is significant because uh, in cases of suspected uh, herbal induced liver injury or drug induced liver injury, we usually go by a causality association uh, in the form of a RUCAM uh, assessment. RUCAM we calculate using uh, the temporal association of a suspected drug. Uh, how long the patient had been taking the drug before the onset of uh, uh, clinically apparent liver injury uh, and how uh, the withdrawal of that offending agent affects the liver function. Whether she had been taken, taking the drug uh, within the last 90 days before the symptom onset and on uh, stopping the drug within two weeks or within eight days how the uh, LFT improves and within two weeks how the LFT improves. So in this case within 10 days her uh, liver uh, enzymes have decreased by more than 50 percent uh, and we have ruled out other causes of uh, possible uh, concomitant uh, drug intake which is hepatotoxic in nature as well as we have ruled out uh, any obstructive causes of uh, worsening of liver function as well as other hepatotropic viruses which can produce a cholestatic 
picture. So in uh, her case, we got a RUCAM score of seven, which uh, signifies a, a probable association of the offending drug causing the liver injury. Now, uh, the liver biopsy results came in, which showed a chronic active hepatitis pattern of injury with evidence of perivenular inflammation and necrosis with mild cholestatic changes. She had a necroinflammatory score of 10 out of 18 and a fibrosis score of 4 out of 6. The features were favoring autoimmune etiology and with a simplified autoimmune score of 6, which gave a, prof uh, a probable AIH as a diagnosis. So she was started on oral uh, prednisolone at a dose of 30 milligram per day. So if you look at the serial liver function, uh, she was uh, uh, started on prednisolone when her liver function, uh, bilirubin was 4.3 and the liver enzymes were in the 330 range. Uh, within one week of starting of uh, prednisolone, her LFT showed significant improvement. And uh, with gradual follow-up, we start, uh, started around 30 and had a, a rapid tapering of uh, prednisolone. Uh, she was tapered off prednisolone within 12 weeks and she's currently off prednisolone and on follow-up. She's doing uh, extremely well. Her liver function is normal and uh, except for mild dyspeptic symptoms, she had an uneventful course of recovery. So the diagnosis was of autoimmune hepatitis related to uh, drug-induced liver injury, or rather a drug-induced uh, drug precipitating an autoimmune hepatitis in her with a RUCAM score of seven and a simplified AIH score of six, no encephalopathy or ascites, no coagulopathy. She was managed with uh, a sodioxycholic acid during the initial period and uh, um, uh, with the visalone or prednisolone in a rapid tapering manner and she's currently off medications and uh, doing well. So uh, coming to the drug which was taken, uh, this is a very common or uh, has been used since decades uh, or other centuries in the Indian uh, traditional Ayurvedic uh, um, med uh, system of medicine. It is part of most of the uh, Rasayanas or it is part of the Rasayana where it is used as a uh, liver or promoter of health. So it is, uh, it, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, people, uh, this found renewed use among the masses as an immune booster. Lots of people were uh, uh, taking uh, Tinospora cardiofolia as an immune booster uh, so as to uh, improve immunity and uh, uh, prevent the complications of uh, COVID-19. Now, the issue with uh, uh, Tinospora is there are three related species. Here you can see the first image. One shows Tinospora cardiofolia. The second is Tinoporia sinensis, and the third is Tinoporia uh, cresta. So the stem is the one that is used uh, for most of the, um, by most of the patients. Uh, they usually soak it in, it can, be in Ayurveda, there are multiple ways of consuming Tinospora. They, you can use an aqueous form, you can use it as a uh, dry paste, um, uh, there are almost 10 different ways, I'm not very, uh, uh, accustomed with it, but there are uh, multiple ways of consuming it and uh, it, it has been used very safely for a long time. Now the proponents of Ayurvedic medicine usually or uh, since uh, in 2019 there was a, a case series published from Mumbai because there were um, all over India there were multiple cases being reported during the COVID pandemic of acute uh, herbal induced liver injury caused due to Giloy. Uh, from all over India because this uh, herb is present all over India from right from the north till the south it's present and it has been used all over India since long. Now during the COVID pandemic this became highlighted because there were lots of drug induced liver injuries being attributed to uh, Tinospora and the case series uh, b from published from Mumbai was met with much chagrin and uh, Ayush uh, had uh, lots of debates on it. They even published uh, uh, a couple of, uh, there are, uh, uh, the third one is actually a publication of in an Ayurvedic journal by Elsevier. It is an interesting read. Uh, I have taken these images from that article. 
So they have said that it is the, cr the third variant, which is uh, vi looks very similar to Cardifolia and is often mistaken as Tenofolia Cardifolia and is taken as a hepatoprotective, but that has hepatotoxicity. So uh, it is an ongoing debate, <laughs> but whatever it is, uh, we uh, as uh, hepatologists, we know that the uh, aqueous extract of Tenofolia Cardifolia itself is a potent stimulator of uh, polyclonal B cells, B cell activation and macrophage stimulation. It, is, it has been proven uh, that uh, Tenofolia Cardifolia increases uh, B cell activation and uh, macrophage activation. Now both of these are uh, mechanisms which are implicated in the pathogenesis of autoimmune hepatitis. So even if the medication is not directly hepatotoxic, in patients who have a latent autoimmune hepatitis or who have a tendency to develop hepatite, uh, autoimmune hepatitis or who may be having a latent chronic liver disease due to autoimmune hepatitis, this intake of this drug can precipitate or produce a flare of autoimmune hepatitis. That is what has likely happened in our case as well. So you know, we have to follow her up to see how she does. As of now, she's doing well off medications. So uh, this goes to say that a medicine which is safe in one individual due to varying f pharmacogenetics of each person, that which is safe in one person may not be safe in another. That was the take home message rather than going against an, a, a herbal medicine. I would like to put, put across the fact that we should be educating people that whatever you take, liver has to metabolize it and it may be safe in 100 people you might be the f f uh, the f next person who takes it may develop a severe liver injury because r from the reported series up to 10 percent patients have uh, died and up to 20 percent required liver transplant because of this liver injury our patient was uh, lucky that she had a mild thought of injury thank you
moving on to our last case for today. Uh, I'll be presenting on non-endoscopic management of massive upper GI bleed. Uh, so we had a 52-year-old male uh, who presented with uh, blood in vomitus since one day, uh, which was large volume, fresh blood, and was associated with giddiness and uh, loss of consciousness. Uh, he also had past history of cirrhosis for which he had underwent and history with history of upper GI bleed for which he had underwent endoscopy and uh, uh, banding. So when he presented to the ER, he was conscious, oriented, BP was on the lower side and he had tachycardia, heart rate was around 124. He had ascites, uh, he was not in NKF and other system examination was normal. So he was managed at the ER with uh, IV tolipresin, antibiotics and PPI. These are the initial set of investigations. Hemoglobin was 5.6 uh, with uh, thrombocytopenia. INR was around 2.1 and mild uremia was also seen. And uh, this was the LFT. Bilirubin was 3.2 and mild transaminitis. So uh, the restrictive transfusion strategy was uh, used. Uh, patient was electively intubated since after since he had two more bouts of large volume hematemesis after he presented uh, to the hospital and he was taken up for the uh, endoscopy. So when we put the scope in, we could see that there was a la pooling of blood within the esophagus. Uh, we couldn't exactly see where the source of bleed was. However, we were able to see a few dilated veins here, as you can see. These are the varices you can see. One, two, and three columns could be seen. So we went ahead with the scopy. We went ahead to make sure that there's, there's no other source other than the esophageal varices which can explain the bleed. Uh, this is the fundus of the stomach. You, uh, there are no isolated gastric varices as such. Even the duodenum was normal. So uh, we thought we'll uh, go ahead with banding for the patient. So uh, since we could not identify the bleeder as such, so we went to the lower part of the esophagus and we started deploying the bands. So a total of four columns of bands were deployed and there was an interim decrease in the bleed. But however, we could see that there was a lot of blood coming uh, from the proximal part of the esophagus as well and uh, again pulling, it, pulling up within the esophagus. So we understood that we have not actually tackled the, uh, the bleeder as such. So uh, we started searching again and for our luck, we were able to find out where the source of bleed is. So this, you can take a look at this side, it was actively bleeding, oozing from there. So uh, we had the band set with us, so we took the, the bleeder within the cap and we deployed a band. In view of the persistent ooze from that site again, so we went to the lower end of the esophagus along the same column because the direction of flow of blood is from the lower end of the esophagus proximally. So we put a band at the lower end of the column. And you can see here, this is the lower end and this is the bleeding spot. Both are in the same line so that uh, the bleed gets controlled. But slowly over the next two minutes, this band slipped off and uh, there was persistent bleed again. So uh, we thought instead of going ahead with the band again, we'll inject glue into the bleeding site. So uh, we've injected uh, two ml of uh, glue into the site. We took, uh, gave two minutes, again, there was persistent bleed. Uh, we took one, we one final attempt uh, uh, by injecting glue again. However, we were not able to control the bleed. So this is when we understood that we should uh, go for a, a Danicella stent. So uh, what we did is we passed a guide wire into the stomach uh, during the same scopy and the scope was removed. So this is a video which I picked up from the internet which can demonstrate how the stent works and what is the uh, what different parts of the stent. So this particular device is railroaded on the, uh, the guide wire which is placed within the stomach. So there is a balloon here uh, which, is, uh, which will be inflated uh, using around 120 ml uh, of air, which is injected at this side, the balloon gets inflated. The after which the entire device is slowly pulled back so that the balloon wedges exactly at the GE junction. So this balloon tightly wedges at the GE junction or, or the cardi of the stomach so that you m you're sure that the stent is within the esophagus. So you'll be able to feel a mild resistance which denotes that the stent is within the esophagus after which the stent is being deployed as you can see here. So this is the stent here which is deployed within the esophagus. So once the stent is deployed you deflate the uh, balloon after which the entire device is taken out. 
So we did this for this patient because we were not able to uh, control the bleed despite banding and glue. And uh, this is how the stent was placed. The stent was in position and uh, the, we could not see any further bleed. So the serial hemoglobin values on the day zero, his hemoglobin was 5.6. He was transfused two units of PRBC after which it was 8.2 and the serial hemoglobin values were stable. He was continued on IV tolipressin for three days and later be started on beta blockers and discharged by fifth day. And after two weeks, we removed the stent and uh, there was a interim, uh, there was a mild decrease, uh, decom uh, compression of, uh, decrease in the size of the varices seen here. So, uh, would like to make a mention of this scientist, uh, Jan Danis, uh, who has contributed to the development of this stent and saved thousands of lives. So uh, he started using the stent in November 2002 uh, on a patient with hemophilia, HCV, and HIV, and history of liver transplantation. So initially, uh, he used those stents which are used for CA esophagus or for uh, uh, fistula in the uh, esophagus, which was a fully covered stent. So uh, this was the first time anyone has used a uh, fully covered stent uh, for uh, upper GI bleed for which he received, apparently received a lot of criticism. But however, uh, the patient uh, had a good result. So after which animal studies were conducted and later in 2006, a pilot study was published. And later on over the years, it has become a part of uh, many of the guidelines. So the indication for a danizella stent is a refractory esophageal bleed. So this is a self-expanding silicone covered uh, nitinol stent. Uh, the length is approximately 135 millimeters and the flare is around 30 millimeters with a body of 25 millimeters. So now it has part, uh, become a part of the NICE guidelines as well as the ESG guidelines and, uh, uh, and is being used as a uh, uh, method for controlling variceal, esophageal variceal bleed in refractory cases. Thank you. The sense taken Blake mode tube has to be decompressed every 24 to 48 hours. So, uh, I otherwise, it causes necrosis of the esophagus. Uh, whereas, so this stays there for 14 days. Patient can go home, come back later after two weeks, and we remove the stent. There's a mild chance that patient might re bleed while during removal because this is a temporary tamponade which, uh, which gives. It's not like tips where it decompresses the portal pressure. So uh, there are chances that he might have a bleed again, but this can be life-saving. Uh, uh, life-saving <laughs> becomes the first uh, uh, choice at that moment. It could be, yes, because the GE junction can be open. Thank you. because they are part of our efficient company. Still, this customer is good today. And let us clearly act. And uh, let us conclude the session with a word of thanks. It is with great pleasure that uh, Astamim's Kannur uh, Gastro team has presented four wonderful uh, case presentation. Uh, and uh, enlighten us uh, with uh, rare cases and its management. Uh, I express my gratitude as well as uh, from the 
Physicians Club of Kanur as well as my personal behalf to Dr. Sabu, uh, Dr. Kavida, Dr. Javed, Dr. Um, Jasim, and uh, I remember the name. Dr. Vivek. All of them as uh, presented the case uh, and uh, enlightened the audience and uh, answered the and participated in the active discussion and uh, uh, once again thank all of the gastro team from Astromims for the excellent presentation. I also thank uh, the audience, my colleagues uh, who has uh, taken their uh, precious time to spend here and as uh, Dr. Prabhagaran said, it is not only the, the knowledge you get, get it here from here, uh, but uh, visiting and uh, communicating each other as uh, years goes by. People will forget each other. So they can remember the different uh, people in different ways of their uh, discussion. Not only the knowledge. Knowledge come and you can get it from uh, internet within a click, five minutes. but. This uh, activity uh, with uh, Ming interaction is uh, a joy forever. And uh, I expect all uh, juniors who have assembled here to come forward and to be active in participating in the future CME programs as well. Uh, once again, uh, my express, I express my sincere thanks to all attending in the session.